Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men podcast, the show helping men to open up about manhood. My name is Simon Rennie and my aim is to get men talking. From mental health to fatherhood and everything in between, Mindful Men creates a safe space for conversation. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to say a huge thank you for joining me. It means a world for you to join me and talk about men's issues. And if you love what you hear, please subscribe and share the episode with your mates. You can also join the conversation on Instagram and YouTube, and I'd love to connect with you there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host, Simon Rooney, and today we're getting mindful about everything anger. I'm really excited today. I've got Renault Purifoy from California on the line. How are you going, Renault? Ah, doing good. Hot it's, out here. <laughs> it's hot out there. What's the temperature? Well, let's see, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what, 40 something centigrade. So wow, wow, that yeah. is hot. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the middle of winter here. So it's a, it's yeah. a nice balmy 20, 20 degrees. So oh, cool, uh, cool, cool. Very nice. Um, mm-hmm. But Renaud, you're, you're an author. Um, yes. And you have a background in counseling and teaching. Mm-hmm. And you're also a dad as well. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's great that you're on the show because Mindful Men podcast is a show that's all about supporting men to become more mindful of who they are. So whether it's their mental health or physical health, whether it's being a dad. And today we're going to be talking about managing anger. And I think it's a really good topic for men to to explore and become more mindful of because when we think about anger, we think about all the, I guess, the destructive components of anger. Before we jumped on today, I, I had a quick look at some Australian data. I'll just run through that quickly now. So according to the Mission Australia website, and I'll put the link in the show notes for anyone who's interested to look at this data, we've got one in six women have experienced physical or sexual violence um, by a current or former partner, while for men it's one in 16. And 75% of victims of domestic violence report the perpetrator as being male, whereas 25% reported the perpetrator to be female. So I think when we look at that data alone and and whenever we hear about family and domestic violence in Australia, we see some pretty horrific stuff on the news in terms of what men do in in relationships and and how anger, I guess, plays out into violence. um, But I guess it's important to note that that's not always the case. Just because people get angry, that doesn't mean they're violent people or they do violent things. But I think this data in in particular just really highlights that it is a bit of an issue in, in our culture and something that we should be mindful of and talk about. So I'm really excited about today's interview. Um, but before we start, I'd like to just hear a bit about your backstory about, you know, where you're from and where you grew up and family life and have you traveled and, and yeah, yeah. what some of those key life events that got led you to here today? Well, I've always been interested in animal behavior. My uh, parents uh, were farmers and they, where they came from farming backgrounds, although they weren't farmers when I was a kid. We had about an acre, well, about a third of an acre or so. So we raised rabbits, chickens, and that type of stuff. And I would train my chickens to get on little boxes and things and stuff. And, you know, just fascinating behavior. And mm-hmm. so it was kind of, it was about, when I went into biology, I was interested in animal behavior. And then later on, when I got my master's in counseling, I just switched over to human behavior. So a lot yeah. of similarities <laughs> between the two, except humans can be a lot cleverer, you know, we because we have all of our, our cognitive abilities, we can hide things and mask things a lot. So but that was my original interest in it. And uh, it, it's, it's been a rewarding career. So yeah, and you grew up in California, or did you move there later on? Or well, California, yeah, uh, Southern California, my dad was a sailor. So he was 21 years Navy. And then when he got out, we moved up to Northern California. So that would be a grade school. So yeah, so most yeah. of the time here. Oh, cool. And have you traveled, done any travel overseas or? I've uh, been to Europe. I've uh, been to Europe a couple times. We'll be going to Italy this fall. So oh, cool. a little bit, yeah. And lived in Japan for two years. So that was a good experience. Wow. I know when my daughter went for her uh, master's, we said, go outside the country. So we got her uh, to, to go to England and uh, to York for her uh, her master's. And oh, wow. It's just, you know, you get outside of the U.S., you know, see how other people live. It's it's I think it's important for people to do. Too many people think this is the way it's done everywhere and it's yeah. not yeah and what was it like living in japan 
Uh, Japan was fun. I was teaching at a Catholic school, uh, mm -hmm. so they were a, a first through uh, 12th grade, and so I taught high school biology and math and I was a homeroom teacher for the sophomores. And, uh, you know, the culture was really different. Of course, this was back in uh, the late 70s, so um, Japan's changed a lot even since then, but just, yeah. uh, you know, to see that people can live very happy lives with a very different outlook on the world. You know, they yeah. don't have to do it particularly the way we do it to, to do well. And I guess you would have seen some of that come up in your counseling career, you know, different ways of looking at the world and, and perceiving mm. the world and understanding the world and, and ourselves within the world as well. Is that right. something that came through for you? Well, yeah. And, and I, I should probably mention my, my wife's Asian American. So, which is, that's why we decided to go to Japan. So, okay. uh, which was, you know, in the, in the late sixties, that was kind of still an unusual marriage It's very commonplace nowadays, but uh, just, you know, Going through all of that was very, very, very different as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and so you're a dad as well. Um, yes, in fact, today we're watching great granddaughter. So, two and a half. Two and a half. Well, I've got a yeah. two and a half daughter, so yeah. um, I'm right in the midst of it at the moment. Yeah. Tell me what it means to you to be a dad. Oh wow, uh, big question. Part, part, a lot of it's just being a role model, you know. Uh, for boys, you know, they learn a lot about how to be men through their fathers. And, and unfortunately, so many, at least in my country, families are single parent families where there really isn't a male role model. And uh, in, in our country, even our schools, our schools are designed for well-behaved little girls. You know, mm -hmm. boys aren't supposed to play tag. They're not supposed to do rough house. You know, they don't get recess as much as they used to. So... There's a lot of, lot of things that are working against young men having strong male role models. And what they see is what they see in TV. You know, so they grow up thinking gangsta rap and, you know, violent movies and stuff. That's, that's what being a man's all about, that they don't get to see a man in, in a loving relationship, uh, having strength, uh, and yet being able to have that strength in a way that's appropriate. Mm. So I think that, that that's a big, big problem. You look at prisons, most of uh, the... Uh, I know a, a couple of guys that do a lot of prison ministry and uh, just about everyone there didn't have a bad dad in the family. You know, so it's, they didn't have that model to keep them straight. Yeah. And I think the way that um, men's culture is also slowly or very slowly shifting. And, and I talk a lot about mental health in, in the podcast mm -hmm. and based on my own experience of depression and anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder since I've, I was eight years old. So I'm 38 now. Mm -hmm. um, and I always talk about the story of growing up in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, which is in South Australia, mm -hmm. um, very working class area, some pockets of lower socioeconomic as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the culture was around growing up in the 90s was around men don't cry and men need to be tough and, and you know, mm -hmm. harden up and don't show emotion. And I always come back to this story of being in primary school and my, one of my best friends, he was crying. And then I automatically went into that, that northern suburbs, masculine male, say, mate, right. boys don't cry. You've got mm -hmm. to stop crying. And he's like, Simon, I can cry if I want to. And <laughs> that was a really powerful thing for me because I yeah. questioned everything I knew about being a man, even mm -hmm. you know, at around 10 years old, nine or 10 years old. And even my own, what was happening internally for me with my OCD at the time, and that stuck with me ever since then. And now in my mid thirties, I'm in a position where I can start openly talking about mental health and for men and, and mm -hmm. challenging what men grew up with in the nineties and, 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 you know, earlier as well, um, mm -hmm. as well. And even today, like I said, there's a lot of boys that still live in that kind of environment where right. they're taught that men have to be hard and men have to be tough and they can't cry and can't show mm -hmm. emotions. So. Well, first of all, that actually was an appropriate way to teach boys when you live in very harsh circumstances mm -hmm. you know uh unfortunately circumstances have changed now you know and so you know anger in, in a sense and that ability to be hard uh even now you look around the world there are places where if you're soft you know you get run over and mm. bad things happen to you so you need to be tough and you need to have that ability to just stuff everything down and keep that stiff upper lip and you know, get out there and, and, and bang heads and, you know, exert your power. So that's kind of the, 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 the one side of the story, because historically you see that operating a lot in our culture or not in our culture, but in cultures throughout history. Right. Mm -hmm. And 
that's one of the problems too when you shift from a culture where that is important to a culture where you have the freedom now to, to express your emotions in a more healthy way at least ways from uh, a middle class you know uh, yeah. culture uh, there's a price you pay when you have that hard exterior uh, you you tend not to take care of important needs and a lot of times it'll really interfere with relationships and when you have a relationship, especially a more egalitarian one, uh, that's something that will damage that relationship a lot. So, again, that's kind of the, the, the positive and the negative to it. There, mm. there are places where it's appropriate. But, and again, most of our situations nowadays, that's not a, appropriate anymore. Yeah. Uh, there are times where you need to be uh, in control. But then there's times you need to be vulnerable, too. And I think that's that's something that people are having a hard time figuring out where's the balance between those two things. That's a great response. Yeah, that's something I haven't mm -hmm. thought about there is that is the, mm -hmm. there's a appropriate times to be both and, and mm -hmm. finding that balance. And I think a lot of people are really struggling with that myself included over the years mm -hmm. is struggling to find where that balance is. So um, before we get into the book and, and we'll talk about anger taming the beast, I'm always interested to talk to people who have gone through a counselling background. So mm -hmm. I'm a social worker and I'm about to embark on my own private practice in literally mm -hmm. three weeks' time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm opening the doors. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you. Uh, Very scary. <laughs> or, 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 or should I say condolences? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll find out in a month's time. <laughs> yeah, about six, in about six months, we'll know, right? Yeah. But I, I'm always interested to find out you've got a master's in counselling and, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that you were interested in, in animals first and then animal behaviour and yeah. then human behaviour. So can you tell us a bit about what drew you to study and become a therapist? Well, I, I had a good friend who was a counsellor and mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, watching him and interacting with him and just uh, my experiences with some of his friends, just, you know, I, I wanted to do something that would help people. I, I basically have a very servant kind of orientation to my mm -hmm. life and so uh counseling seemed to be a great way to do it um if people can change the way they think and change some of the way they respond to situations then that can make a big difference uh, for their own life and that's for those that are surrounding them so make the world a little bit better yeah and, and was there any kind of um psychotherapist or psychologist or or anything like that that really that you kind of mirrored your counseling practice on? It's changed during the years. Uh, when I first started, I was very much a cognitive behavioralist. Uh, and then as time went on, and I was actually, I, I was into hypnosis uh, initially, mm -hmm. and then NLP came out. I got involved with all of that. Uh, eventually got into something called uh, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing, EMDR. Mm -hmm. Found that to be just excellent modality use that hardly ever use hypnosis in fact i never do any after i learned that yeah. uh, it's got to be a, a, a more of a psychodynamic component to my work uh, in fact uh, now i kind of look at what i call core response patterns and mm -hmm. you have a you know some of the classic ones are things like learned helplessness uh, or the idea of do you have a external locus of control or internal those are kind of classic ones but everybody has their own set of uh response patterns, for example, anger is dangerous, or uh, uh, I shouldn't feel, you know, or I got to do things right, you know, these types of response patterns, which are really just a, a large collection of conditioned response patterns and belief systems that support them that that developed as you grew up. So looking at those and how you change those uh, became a real big focus in, in a lot of my practice. And that's a lot of what I do in the book is I'll use examples and talk about how People. In fact, with the anger book, I use uh, four people, two mm -hmm. people that have explosive anger and two people that have, uh, they, they repress their anger, so they stuff it and talk about how those core response patterns develop and how you have to attack them on, on a number of different levels if you want to change them. You got to work on your belief systems, you got to work on behaviors, uh, and you just got to practice that stuff. And over time, those becomes your new associations and your new habit patterns that you do. And the old ones will tend to just come back when you're sick, hungry, and tired. They will. And, that, and that's an important message, you know, yeah. because people think I'm going to change all the stuff and it'll never come back. But no, when you're under a lot of stress, you're sick, hungry, and tired, mm -hmm. that's when some of that old programming sometimes will start to seep through. And that's yeah. oftentimes just a message that you are sick, hungry, tired, or stressed out. And you need to take care of yourself. 
And that's a really important message as well, because when we we work with people in that therapeutic environment, it's really important to recognize that sometimes the wheels do fall off. Yeah. Um, But it's important just to put them back on. Yeah. And it's it's an important message because a lot of times, especially with anxiety disorders, you'd oftentimes have very high achievers, Mm -hmm. people who uh, tend to ignore their body. And so a lot of times when some of those old patterns start creeping up and stuff, or you start getting getting irritated. I mean, I, I used to, joke that there's a change in how I use language when I get really stressed out. And again, my mm-hmm. dad was a Navy guy, right? So, you know, if I start seeing some of that stuff coming up, that means either something's getting to me or I'm just tired, you know, yeah. and maybe I need to take care of those basic needs. And those are just messages that your emotions are giving to you. Yeah. And so what made you retire from private practice? And then you went into teaching. Is that right? Yeah. Well, practicing in California is crazy. And Mm -hmm. I never was associated with a large agency. I always did fee for service, did a lot of reduced uh, fee service. Mm -hmm. And just the regulations and just all that stuff uh, just kept making it harder and harder for sole practitioners. And so I decided it's time to move into something else. And so I started teaching psych at a little local college and they had me teach other things as well. So, yeah, and uh, the transition was good for me. What was it like going into a, a, a teaching role and um, like what were some of the highlights that you can think of over your teaching career? Well, I started out before I got my master's teaching uh, high school mm-hmm. and I taught high school math and biology. And yeah. uh, when I went to Japan, I was teaching biology as well as pre-algebra and some of the other stuff that they needed me to do. And uh, so I, I like teaching. I, I really enjoyed teaching adults. <laughs> You know, high school, there's a lot of that high school baloney you got to put up with, you know, and adults, uh, you, you can talk to them like adults. And even though a lot, a lot of the students were, uh, you know, they, they were young adults, you know, they were 19, 20. Uh, we mm-hmm. had a lot of people returning from the workforce and stuff and or into the workforce. Uh, and and uh, just for me, that that's easier for me to relate to. You know, they're ready to learn. Uh, they want to learn. Uh, at least was most of them. And some of those younger ones, their parents were making them go. So it's, not necessarily that group, right? <laughs> it's very challenging. I mean, my first in social work, we've got to do two practical placements. And my first placement was in a high school in a chaplaincy yeah. unit. So, yeah, I remember going back into high school as a mid 30 year old and, and had my backpack yeah. on and my lunch box. And, and yeah. all of a sudden I was a sir. People were calling me sir. And, but you have to really... Yeah find your inner child i think to it to relate to a lot of the students um yeah. and try to remember how how to be a student again in order to get messages yeah. across and and as you say sometimes it's just they don't want to be in class or they don't want to be there they're getting made to do it by a teacher or a parent or something yeah. like that so it's real challenging um yeah. but also really valuable as well i guess to try and shape the future of a young person as well um and I think one of the things I like, since I, I came from a clinical background, uh, application is always my interest. So I did a lot of that within the psych classes because, you know, a lot of the the, the, the psych books, uh, textbooks, they're just very theoretical and a lot mm-hmm. of the application is very weak. Yeah. So we, we got to do a lot, of, a lot of fun application and talked about, you know, distorted forms of thinking and do exercises with that type of stuff and things. And so they, they found that very valuable. And that's actually something that comes up in my social work groups as well in terms of our, mm-hmm. like I've only just finished the master's last year and a mm-hmm. lot of that's still theory-based. Even in 2021, it's still theory-based mm-hmm. and they were crying out for more practical right. ways of, of, of training and so forth. I guess we get that in the placements, but I think a lot of the, even the, the tutorials and lectures, we could go into more practical-based work. So I right. think things still need to improve in that area and in certain curriculums as well, but... But that's another story. That's a that's a social right. work <laughs> event there. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's talk about anger taming the beast. Uh, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on anger. Um, can you tell us a bit about why you thought it was important to write the book and and what made you actually do it? One of my pet peeves about a lot of self help books is they're what we just talked about. They're high on theory and understanding mm-hmm. and insight, but very weak on application. So how do I take these insights and actually translate that into something that's practical and so i I saw a need for that that particular book type of book and especially you know from a from a case study perspective where you're Mm -hmm. not only giving theory but you're following people that are actually applying that theory into their lives and 
how they struggle with that, you know, how they have successes, they have setbacks, and then, you know, they learn from those setbacks so they can move ahead with the next level. And, and especially the, I wanted to include the idea of people that suppressed anger, because mm -hmm. most of your anger books are geared towards people that are explosive and they're kind of out of control anger. And that it's an underrepresented group in terms of those people that tend to just stuff it all. It gets addressed to some degree in books on assertiveness, but even assertiveness books kind of don't deal with that idea that how do I learn not to stuff all my anger, how to express it when it's appropriate and in an appropriate way. Yeah. So, so how would you define anger? Like, and is there different types of anger? Well, well anger is basically one of two core responses we have to threat. So if you feel threatened, you're either going to be fearful or angry. Now, when I use those terms, I'm talking about them in a very broad perspective. So mm -hmm. fear can range from apprehension to panic. Anger can range from irritation to rage. It's the same circuitry in our brain, and it's a response to threat. Whether we go with anger or fear has to do with how we assess the threat, and that's usually done at an unconscious level. If the anger is viewed as manageable, then, I, excuse me, if the threat is viewed as manageable, then we're going to attack it and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. If the threat is unmanageable, then it's, we're going to back away from it. We're going to become fearful. And again, here we get into a lot of conditioning as you grow up, a lot of your belief systems, because sometimes people see threats where there are no threat. And mm -hmm. then that would be an, an irrational form of anger, right? If there's a real threat, then you need to do something about it. And so how you respond becomes now the question. Anger is actually the energy that is underneath any time you assert yourself. So mm -hmm. if I'm something, but he says something or does something that bugs me, okay, and if I set limits with him, part of what's, what is uh, uh, energizing that behavior is anger. And that, that I think is the key to healthy anger is learning that okay, it's okay to be angry, uh, but how do I express it? And what is it that is triggering that anger? Is it a real threat? Is it a real need? And if so, how am I going to address that need, you know, with the least amount of harm to myself and others? Then usually I'll choose some kind of appropriate response. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, a lot of how we respond is, again, childhood training, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And when yeah. you say threat, like, Obviously, people think it's an immediate uh, mm -hmm. physical threat right in front of us, but that could also be a, a threat around concepts, around identity as, as well, do you think? Oh, sure. Yeah, my, my position, you know, my feeling of am I being attacked as a man or is my position uh, in a relationship, you know, uh, your mate says something derogatory, you know, that threatens your self-esteem, your self-image. Um, all those things can be threats. And, and again, that's can be very unique to the individual. And that's where, you, again, you need to take a look at, is it a real threat or am I responding because of some kind of, you know, childhood pattern or irrational thinking that's going on inside of me? For example, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I have to do things right, you know, and I think I'm a very competent, uh, I, I know how to do stuff. I, I know how to work on cars. Okay, I'm working mm -hmm. on the car. I, I've got a piece left over. Wow. Wife comes in and says, you know, How's it going? At that moment, I'm feeling helpless and weak and because I don't know what I'm doing here, right? And that's not an okay feeling, so I convert to anger because anger gives me a feeling of strength. And now I feel strong. It doesn't do any good. <laughs> it doesn't help the situation, but at least I have that adrenaline coursing through me and I have that physical sensation of strength. So a lot of times when, when people have taboos about being weak or inadequate, uh, anger is used to give them that at least a feeling of strength so they don't mm -hmm. have to feel that sensation or that that that, that uh, awareness of being out of control or weak. Yeah, and at, at the start of the the show, we talked mm -hmm. about the destructive versions of anger that we right. see in things like family mm -hmm. and domestic violence. But can anger be constructive as well? Well, sure. Uh, again, like I said, whenever you assert yourself, anger is underneath that, and that's again the key: tuning into anger when it's at a low level and choosing actions that are appropriate to meet whatever it is that's, you know, generating the anger. And we call it irritation at a low level, mm -hmm. right? Irritation, I'm getting bugged. Okay, now you're kind of getting under my skin. Okay, now <laughs> and it, and it moves up. So it's just where the dial is at, right? So being able to understand at that first level, and of course, people who have explosive anger, mm -hmm. one of the things that they need to lock into place early on is a walkaway strategy. You do that with domestic violence. 
yep. is that you start to get angry, you need to walk away because your initial training is to, you know, go nuts on the person. And so you need to walk away, calm down, take a look at, okay, what is it that's triggered by anger? Is it appropriate? Okay, how do I need to go back down and deal with that? Or if it's inappropriate, then I need to deal with, with those issues with the side of myself. Yeah. And, and so from, from that perspective, leading into the next question is why do some people act differently in, when they are angry? So some people will rage and, and other mm. people tend to remain in control or, or bubble away. Like why, why is it different between different people? combination between genetics and tra and childhood background mm -hmm. right? uh you know you had, you had an excellent study over new zealand started in, in 72 the dindlin study mm -hmm. and they took every baby born in 72 and they've been following them and they you can divide babies into five different groups you know and you got those babies that are kind of easy going you got the evil can evil kids you got the out of control kids and then depending upon what type of environment they go into you know those two things interact you get a kid who's maybe uh, can be fairly middle of the road easygoing kid but they grow up in a violent family where the mm -hmm. modeling is you know you need to you know be tough and you need to you know challenge people and you need to let that anger out whenever you get challenged with stuff stuff uh they're going to grow up behaving that way now there there, there is that very small group that's kind of out of control but they tend to be in prisons anyway so Mm. they're not usually in general society that much most people what you see if they're out of control usually it's because of their childhood training and and so like for someone who, who's not out of control but someone who's maybe bubbling away what's some of the the red flags that they can maybe tune into as well like and and redirect themselves if before they do blow up and become a volcano for healthy anger management i think one of the steps is you need to stop and identify why am i angry mm. sometimes that's easier said than done you know yeah. but it, really take a look at so what is it that made me angry okay uh my mate said this and i got angry okay why does that make you angry what is it about you is it was it because they're saying something that's not true is it something that's an innocent comment and i'm reacting to it in a very negative way if i'm bubbling away then it might be something that's an ongoing issue that i need to address is there something at work or at home Mm -hmm. or something in my life that uh, I need, I need to take care of. One of the themes that, 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 that I'm very big on is emotions are messages. Mm -hmm. They're messages about needs and wants that are either being taken care of or not being taken care of. And so the negative ones are telling you that there's something in your life that you need to deal with. And so it's a matter of identifying it. And like with my anxiety clients, uh, they would start to have panic attacks sometimes, not understand it at long after they've done well. And so I'll say, okay, go through your checklist. Mm -hmm. How's my primary relationship? How's work doing? How are the kids? How are my life goals? And as you go through those lists and the same thing with people that are angry, a lot of times they'll say, well, this happened, but it wasn't that big a deal. Well, okay, your emotions are telling you it was a big deal. So yeah. let's come up with a plan for addressing that. Yeah, and one of the common things whenever I go see a, my own psychologist or counselors, and also mm -hmm. when I'm doing my practical work back in my studies was, are you doing any self-care? What does your mm -hmm. self-care look like? Are you exercising? Are you eating right? Mm -hmm. Are you eating the wrong foods? Are you consuming too much technology, TV, phones? Mm -hmm. We've had COVID the last two years, two or three years mm -hmm. as well. We, in Australia, we've had lockdowns where people haven't been able to leave their house for right. four to five months on end and, and so forth. So I think that's identifying that and tuning into ourselves, becoming mindful mm -hmm. of why we're getting triggered. And, then, and I, like, I like that checklist idea of, of ticking off things, you know, where, where are things lacking and where can we maybe put some measures in to address that mm -hmm. lacking as well. And people who need to be in control and who need to be on top of stuff, a lot of times are out of touch when things are lacking. And so they, they really need to sit down and go through that checklist. And, and whenever they come up with something and say, well, it's not a big deal, just honor the fact that if if I'm reacting emotionally, either with anger or fear or something else, then it's telling me that it's an issue I need to address. Uh, one of the things that that I used to like with the, with the anxiety clients is I told them you have to keep short accounts because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's going to come up as anxiety. Now, with people who are angry, a lot of times they don't have that reactive system, but it's the same idea. If, if you're finding things are bugging you a lot, then there's something in your life you need to address. And so identifying that becomes important. 
So let's talk a bit about uh, anger in relationships. And I guess it's really important to, when we're in a relationship, obviously we're not looking after ourselves anymore. We're mm. looking after a, another person or people in, in, in the household or wherever. Um, tell me, I guess, from your experience, how anger has shown up in different various relationships and how it impacts relationships. Well, for, for the person, it tends to be explosive. Um, people don't want to be around you. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times it, it ends the relationship, right? And, unless they're they're in a relationship with somebody who's a very passive individual and who's grown up where that's been the model of the way relationships work. At the other end of the uh, spectrum, somebody who tends to suppress all the time, they aren't getting their needs met usually because they're not speaking up. And so what you'll get is a lot of passive aggressive stuff where you mm -hmm. kind of get back in the in the sneaky ways. In, in fact, that might, might be a kind of opening talk about conflict, right? Because yep. when we talk about anger um, and assertiveness and all stuff, we're talking about conflict. And when two people are in a relationship, whether it's business, casual, whatever, there's going to be conflict. I mm -hmm. want to have Chinese food. You want to have, you know, Mexican. I want to watch this. You want to watch that. I want to go here. You want to go there. How do you resolve that conflict? And you can think of it along a line. And at one end, you have non-assertive. So that's where a person basically, I'm going to take care of your needs. I'm going to ignore mine. At mm -hmm. the other end, you have people that are aggressive. And that's where, take care of my needs. I don't care about yours. It's all about me. And then somewhere in between is what business people would call, call a win-win situation, right? And you, have any, and you have all kinds of different degrees along that line. You can go from assertiveness, become a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more passive. And... All three of those behaviors are appropriate. Mm -hmm. There are times when being very aggressive is appropriate. If uh, I'm dealing with somebody, you know, my, my child is, is in a stroller and she's rolling down the street and I'm going to be very aggressive going after that, right? Or if something else like that's going on. If I'm in police and I'm dealing with an immature personality, uh, I need to be aggressive in order to control that situation. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the side, there are times when a non-assertive or passive stance is appropriate. If I'm living in a dictatorial country where bad things happen to me, if I speak up, I better be quiet, right? Mm -hmm. If, uh, well, my mom, my mom, when she was getting older, uh, there were things that she did that are just, you know, they're off the wall. Uh, the relationship is important to me. It's not that big deal to me. So I just changed the subject. I'm not going to try to set limits there. She's too old. Uh, we'll just move the subject somewhere else. And that's appropriate, right? Yeah. In uh, most of our middle class types of situations, especially with our mates and work and stuff, that middle ground is appropriate. Again, depending upon, you know, some some work environments and stuff, you got to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, some just that middle road works. So again, that's the message is all of those, that whole spectrum can be appropriate depending upon the situation. So what about in a, in a relationship where two explosive people in a relationship, you know, <laughs> ha, it was, they don't want to end the relationship or anything like that, but what yeah. could they do maybe to try and meet some middle ground, do you think? Well, they, they probably should get into counseling <laughs> and, <laughs> and get some, you know, some, 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 some help on that. Uh, you know, it's it's really important, I think, that, that idea of, of walk-away strategies, you know, and, and you have to have both people, because okay, the more more common example is the explosive personality with a passive personality, mm. or somebody who comes from a reasonable family who's married a person who turns out to be explosive, mm -hmm. right? Um, and both people have to agree to this idea that, okay, if I'm feeling like I'm getting ready to explode, I'm going to tell you I need to take a time out and you need to be able to give me that time out without following me and nannering at me, you know, because mm -hmm. that's not good. So, and then come back and then whatever the issue is, resolve it after the person's calmed down and, and decided what, what, what they need to do about that. Uh, a lot of times you need a coach to help with that. Mm -hmm. Now with exp explosive anger, I, I might mention there's two things that tend to keep that going with a person. One is a lot of times they have this belief that, this is just the way I am. Deal with it. You know, I can't help myself. You know, that's not true. Mm -hmm. If you follow that person around, they control their temper very well in certain situations. If they're in a court situation, if they're in mm -hmm. front of their boss, they will tend to control themselves. They explode around in places where, quote, it's safe, right? Around the wife, the kids or whatever. 
So you can control your emotions. There's a very small number of people that genetically cannot control their emotions. We're not dealing with that. And that's probably not, you never want to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, as an adult, we have the ability to control ourselves. Uh, we say this person is acting like a two-year-old because two-year-olds can't control themselves a lot of times. They are explosive. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, we have the ability. So you need to, first of all, buy into the concept that I can control myself. The second thing is this idea that, well, it's not that big a deal. So I blew up on her or so I blew up on the kids, whatever. It, that's really, it's not that important. The reality is, is that it is important. You damage relationships, you damage your kids. Uh, mm -hmm. you miss out on opportunities if you don't control your, your anger. Unfortunately, a lot of times law enforcement has, has to get involved before a person will actually face that and, and understand that that is reality. I can control myself if I practice it, and it does have negative consequences when I don't control myself. Why do you think that's the case? Like, why does it take such a, an, an event to happen for someone to start recognizing that? Well, it gets back to what you're talking about, your background. You know, if you grow up in an environment and in a family where that's the norm, then, and probably, you know, the, the, the father or the same-sex parent it could have been a, a woman. By the way, one of the interesting things about the, the, the Needland study is they found women are just as violent as men. Mm -hmm. The difference being men are stronger, so they do more damage. And when law enforcement gets involved, uh, they, uh, they uh, usually focus on the man. Mm -hmm. And men who are in relationships with violent women don't like to admit it. <laughs> it's interesting so it's you just... say that because I was doing a, a presentation at uni and I, uh -huh. it was around um, health system and I decided to pick male victims of domestic violence as my yeah. topic. And the, there's not much data of, around men speaking up about being the victims. And the data that was there was that when, say, they present at hospital um, with injuries, I'll just say yeah. that they fell over or got hurt at work because yeah. yeah. I guess a bit of shame or maybe yeah. Of, yeah. of being in that kind of situation. So it's really interesting that you just raised that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to admit that my wife beat me up, <laughs> but, but even in situations where both of them get get into it afterwards, uh, again, law enforcement is going to come in and they're going to isolate the male and focus on them. Yeah. It's, 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 it's statistics are interesting. So. And I guess the data backs it up as well. Well, the, that was one of the big, big, uh, well, the, the Needle study had a lot of things like that that they found that were very controversial. Of course, mm -hmm. the whole feminist movement would rejected that outright, right? But there have been follow-up studies in the U.S. and the U.K. that have backed up what the Needle the Needle study says or found. Uh, it's just you still have that idea that men are the predators. You know, everything's bad because of us and our anger and our you know cavemen inside. And, and the reality is, is no women can be mm. out of control just as much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what about what about the kids, the impacts on our kids? So we might have a, a, a child that's hanging off the, the ceiling fan and, and carry, carrying mm. on and we're about to erupt ourselves or maybe we have started yelling. What's the impact on our children and how the children impact us and in, in our responses? You know, they learn that's how you're supposed to be. <laughs> mm. Although one interesting side thing that, that you do find is, especially with the helicopter parents who try to make everything okay with their kids, uh, a lot of times you'll have a kid who does not learn how to control themselves. And one of the other interesting things that came out of the Dunedin study with kids is that the most important thing you can teach kids is self-control and mm -hmm. how to control their emotions. That's going to do more for them being successful as an adult than anything else. So if a parent does not set limits with a child and allows them to be out of control, then they're just going to carry that behavior on into school. And unfortunately here in the States, uh, we don't put any limits on our kids anymore. You can have a totally out of control kid in the classroom. You can't get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And so, and you can't flunk them in a lot of school systems now. So they just learn, I can do what I want and I'm just going to just move along fine. And that's going to really hit them when they can become an adult because now they're going yeah. to go out in the world. They're not going to have the ability and the skills to control themselves in an environment and to, uh, provide for themselves and so that leads into all the other negative stuff you see in, in our culture yeah what about if like maybe we've we've responded in a way like in terms of we've we've smacked our child and there's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, studies these days that says that smack is not so 
I guess, PC anymore or we've, right. or we've had an outburst, we've, we've yelled and then all of a sudden we're feeling guilty about that. What's some advice that you could give to a parent who might have just exploded or, or done something that they're not feeling like that really fits the purpose? Well, I think two things in terms of the parent for future, they need to learn some alternative behaviors. And a lot of times what happens is you will do with your kids what was done to you unless mm-hmm. you've learned some alternative behavior. So either some books or some classes, parenting books. I taught parenting classes for a long time in, in the lo- local school district. And it was fun, uh, you know, because parents, you know, that was one of their big things is I, I'm i never going to do to my kid what was done to me. And the kids sitting there staring at you and being stubborn and suddenly that parent comes yeah. out, right? Uh, especially when you're sick and retired. Uh, so unless you have a sp- some specific behaviors you're going to do, you will continue to go back to those old behaviors. So that's the one thing that the parent mm-hmm. needs to do. As, and if you have those behaviors and you're starting to practice in them and yet you slip, then that's okay. You, you talk to the child later on when things are calm and you say, you know, I'm sorry that I exploded on you. That wasn't appropriate. Now let, let's deal with, this, with what was going on with you. And you have a conversation. This gets to another parenting issues, right? Mm. We teach at unteachable moments, right? Yep. Yeah, I like the kids, that. A- kids angry, throwing a tantrum, and so I'm going to teach him at that moment. Or the kid is uh, just broken his favorite toy, right? So now I'm going to give him the toy care lecture. And unfortunately, we do that all the time. When the kid is upset, you're not going to do any effective teaching. So you mm-hmm. need to just calm things down. And then later on, when things are calm, that's when you have the conversation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do that because we, with a lot of parents nowadays, they're so busy, locked into their little devices. Uh, they, they're not spending time with their kids. For example, car time. Car time is a great time to talk to your kids. Not have everybody plugged into their <laughs> social media or their YouTube or watching some video. Uh, but actually turning things off and talking about stuff, having times yeah. during the day where you talk to stuff. In fact, doing things with your kids, cooking. Kids love to cook, you know, or they love to do uh, some project. You know, if it's a boy and, and he's in mechanical and you're mechanical and you're building stuff, that's a great time to do your teaching. That's when you, you give your messages, you know, a few thousand of them while they're growing up, and then it'll start to sink in. You won't teach when everybody's upset. Yeah, I love all, that. All they, all they learn that. is how to be upset. Mm. there's a lot of talk around um parents these days myself included we try to be perfect and and but we we do stuff up and Mm. and there's this concept around good enough parenting i'm wondering if you've heard about that and what your thoughts are about good enough parenting well it sounds like something i that i've known that i've thought and taught for a long time is you're not going to be perfect (laughs) Mm. you know by definition perfection is impossible Mm -hmm. right so I think of it kind of like money is in the bank, right? If you're doing time with your kids and you're having positive experiences and you're being encouraging and encouraging doesn't mean you're always telling them how good they are, right? It's maybe saying, wow, you worked hard at that, or I'm glad to see that, you know, you chose a good behavior. Those are all encouraging types of things as well as you did a good job, right? Mm -hmm. That's putting money in the bank, right? And then when you're (laughs) sick or retired, and you yell at the kid, you do something that's that's not maybe appropriate or whatever, you're, you're doing a withdrawal. Mm-hmm. So if you're putting more money into the bank than you are in withdrawals, then, you know, it's going to go well. In fact, teenage years are the hardest time, right? And the thing that's going to get you through those years more than anything else is your relationship. Mm-hmm. You can have lousy parenting skills, but if you have a wonderful relationship with your kid, you're going to manage them well through there. Likewise, kids or parents who are doing things by the book, but they don't really have the relationship, mm-hmm. they're going to have trouble when the kid hits that uh, pre-adolescent, adolescent time, because now there's no relationship. They're not going to buy you as a uh, person to talk to when they're having troubles, right? You're, not, you're no longer an advocate or a counselor for them. So quality of your relationship is going to determine how successful you are as you get out of those young ages, because you can intimidate a little kid. Mm. But mm. there's a point where they're going to understand you can't make me. Yeah. 
Yeah. Some kids learned that real early. Some <laughs> kids learned that later on. But at some point, they're going to learn you can't make me. And so unless they buy you as, you know, their their advocate and their consultant and as, a, as somebody they can talk to, uh, you're in deep doo-doo at that point. And so that's why quality of relationship is your number one predictor of how successful you're going to be with kids. I really like that because of, as most parents, my wife and I, we just want our kids to grow up and wanting being okay to talk to us if something's wrong or, mm-hmm. you know, they get into that teenage and even when they get to become adult, you know, adults mm-hmm. themselves is still right. feeling safe to come and talk to us. And I think it's that quality of relationship that you're talking about that can really foster that uh, moving forward. With little kids, you call it special time, right? Mm-hmm. In fact, I used to tell with little kid, like you have a young child, it's just say special time. Um, and whenever you're playing together, doing things that are fun, and, and that's something actually, as they get older, uh, you can say, well, you know, I, I've, I'm busy with this right now. We can have some special time later on. Now, as, as a teenager, obviously, you know, preteen, you're not going to call it special time, but you still need to do that stuff. Maybe you go down and get a shake, you know, or maybe you just play a video game with them, or maybe you're going to do something uh, that they enjoy doing. Um, yeah, and like I said, a lot of kids like to cook. At least both both my, both my kids did. So going and whipping up something that they like together, you know, is a useful activity as well as playing stuff. Mm. Uh, and that's when you do your teaching. You know, that's when you go back, you know, and you were having trouble with, uh, with Bobby the other day. So what was going on there? And you talk about it. Oh, so how, how do you think you might have handled that differently? And so now you can start to, you know, do those types of conversations. Again, you're not going to do it in the middle of the fight or in the middle of when everybody's upset or when you're upset or the kid's upset. Uh, so you just maintain order. And then later on, when you're having a positive time together, that's when you do your teaching. Yeah. And I love those moments as well, because they can often teach us a lot about life for, through their mm-hmm. eyes. You know, we, we yeah. see it through this, this adult eyes and, and we've got our own biases and experiences yeah. and beliefs, but they have a completely different set of views and about how the world should work or how it does work. And Mm-hmm. and feelings and emotions and connections and all that. So it's actually quite a, a, a two-way learning moment as well, I believe. And it's, it's the stuff that sticks. Mm, that's right. And that's the stuff, that, that gold yeah. relationship stuff, yeah. Yeah, because again, in, in, in families where you don't have that, um, they're going to learn their values and they're going to learn their problem solving from TV, from mm-hmm. uh, you know, music, from YouTube, um, you know, social media. And unfortunately, you know, you go back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, most of what kids saw on TV and in music reinforced the values that you needed to be a successful adult. Today, it's the opposite. Most of what they're seeing and hearing is not really going to train them into how to be a successful and uh, happy adult, Uh, which is another good reason why you need to have control over media. By uh, my, uh, uh, I have a cousin who uh, is great because her kids now are in uh, junior high and high school. Mm-hmm. And when they come home, the first thing they do is they put their phones in a basket. Yeah. And they have all the controls in the house. So internet goes off at a certain time, you know, and those types of things. So, you know, there's no computer in their home or in their room, rather. Computers are out in common areas where you can monitor what's going on. In mm. fact, the whole idea of having a TV in a kid's room, I think, is, is crazy. Yeah, that's so common nowadays. Uh, keep that stuff in common areas so you can monitor what's going on. If they want to be in their room, you can read a book, right? Yeah, you and you mentioned books. YouTube before as well. So a lot of the parents that I speak with and, yeah. and in our household as well, like our kids don't actually watch. We call it normal TV, so just the usual yeah. TV, the free-to-air yeah. TV. They're, they primarily watch YouTube. and. And we monitor yeah. that with the, there's a YouTube kids app and, and, right, right. Um, and we're watching what they watch as well, but it's so diverse in what they watch compared to what we had like a set structure of different types of TV shows, as you said, that yeah. were feeding into our values or feeding into our way of culture and all that. But it's yeah. now it's, they've got access to the world of content. Mm-hmm. Um, and YouTube is, is an interesting one. Um, for, I think for, for modern day parents, particularly for young kids, it's so it's so out there and, and um, so, so capitalist and consumerist in a, in a, in a way that it, the, the, the shows that they watch as well, it's, it's like presents all the time and holidays all the time. And it's this, this uh, idea or the, yeah, this kind of like oasis style life that um, they yeah. think is reality, which is not. 
And if you want this is want to make a successful teen movie, you have the kid breaking all the rooms, the adults are all stupid, and there's no consequences. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> that, that will be most of your teen movies you get nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's good stuff out there, uh, but you just have to monitor it and you have to limit the amount of time they're spending mm -hmm. consuming it. Yep. And they'll complain, uh, but that's okay. They'll yeah. get angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if that's just you establish it at a young age, then it just comes to be part, a part of how yeah. the household is run. That's I mean, right. I'm, I'm glad I, I'm not doing young kids at the time. I mean, like today, uh, after nap time, we spend some time with uh, uh, Coco Melon and some of that stuff on, mm. you know, on YouTube. And she, that's, that's kind of her waking up time. Yeah, so. yeah. We're still in the Coco Melon stage and Blippi yeah. and Ryan, yeah. all, all yeah. that. All that stuff, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, it's, it's a whole, whole new world I, I'm, I'm learning about. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually my five and a half year old. We're he's getting into Pokemon, so I'm actually Pokemon okay. was something come out when I was in school as well. So I'm yeah, rediscovering yeah, yeah. my inner inner yeah, child as well, playing and talking about yeah. Pokemon with him. It's it's really nice actually. Yeah. Um, but well, my my son was into Robotech a lot, so so nice, nice. Yeah. Um. I've got one more question around, around the book and then I'll get some advice for you. I, I mean, I could talk to you all day, but a, a mm. great mind that I'd love to unpack as well in, in this area. But I just want to finish off on a, around resentment and you know, what it is and, and mm. often like how do people let go of situations where they might have got angry or someone's triggered them in a, in a certain way or an event's triggered them in a certain way and how can they kind of, but they hold on to this resentment for a long time and it makes it causes yeah. anger or anxiety or, or whatever. How can I let go of that? Well, first of all, resentment is where you constantly remember a wrong <clears throat> and you get angry over and over and over again. You tell yourself a lot of inflammatory stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I think with uh, resentment, um, oftentimes, again, this is something that was modeled. A lot of times it was the same sex parent. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, but it's, but it's commonly for that. I think the first step is take a look at, you know, what does it do for me to be resentful? If you tend to resent things a lot, understand that it's not hurting the person that you're resenting. It's just hurting yourself. It's a lot of uh, wasted moments and times in your life. And it, physiologically, it's not good for you either. Uh, mm -hmm. So first of all, you have to buy into the idea that resentment's not good for me. It's not healthy. Um, and it's probably going to, if it's with my primary relationship, then it's going to cause me to do, again, passive aggressive, if not aggressive stuff towards that person. Uh, so it's going to damage the relationship. So I think if, if, if there's something you're resenting, you need to stop and say, so what is it that was going on that, that I see was wrong? Mm -hmm. And then is it, was it real? Or do I have some kind of irrational thinking about that? Do I have some should must rules about the way things should or must or have to be that's being violated? right um uh, if it's a real issue then i need to decide how am i going to address that with this person okay. again if you're the type of person that stuff stuff a lot uh some people have what i call the vesuvius effect right they stuff 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 <laughs> they explode mm -hmm. and then they stuff 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 then I, again i need to deal with stuff when it's at that initial low level uh and set some boundaries or problem solve uh resentments may actually have to do with uh, i'm not setting some boundaries that are pro important for me so why am I resentful you know what is what is causing it you know and is it appropriate or is it due to something that's irrational inside of me some wrong belief systems about the way the world should be uh do I have an uh over inflated idea about justice and you know right and wrong mm -hmm. do I have the belief that if somebody wrongs me then vendetta is okay I mean some cultures that's that's a cultural thing right uh, if somebody wrongs you, you you do a vendetta against them, and you make sure that everybody that's associated with it gets hurt by it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you need somebody to help you sort that out. Uh, you know, I mean, I have a whole chapter on that in the book where we talk about some of the types of thinking that feed into resentment. But this this sense of right and wrong um, a lot of times has to do with it, and sometimes it's it's not really a an accurate sense of right and wrong it's just it's it's kind of an irrational sense yeah and, and i guess to be tuned into it sometimes we have to start challenging ourselves and challenging mm -hmm. our own beliefs if if it's something that's holding us back but we want to let it go mm -hmm. um challenging it can help us become mindful of who we are and, and and adapt the way that we think and feel so 
who's the right type of people that can help us with this? Is it a counselor or a therapist or what kind of modalities maybe that might be useful for someone who well, wants to challenge beliefs? And- certainly counselors and therapists are very good. Um, sometimes it can be somebody, you know, that just has a good head on their shoulders mm-hmm. and deals with things right. You know, like, you know, before we had counselors and therapists, you would go to, you know, the uncle, you know, or the person in the town that you knew about. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of those anymore. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times your counselor, your counselor or your therapist is your paid friend, right? That has a good head on their sh- shoulder. It could be a, a priest or a rabbi or you know, a pastor or something like that. Sometimes they have training and they they can help you identify those types of things. Uh, modern world, probably counselors, you know, are, are the main outlet. Uh, you know, you know, picking up a good book, you know, my book uh, yep. will certainly give you things. One, one of the things I do in there is, is I have these uh, summary sheets, which I used to use with clients. And so it's basically four parts. Why is this a problem? So why do I get resentful? And, and this is just a possibility, right? There's a lot of different possibilities. Well, my dad was rent sinful all the time. He used to punish people when they did things wrong to them. Now I'm just acting like my dad. Okay, so that's where it comes from. This doesn't change anything, but one of the things I found is having a simple explanation for why you do what you do is important because people do a lot of what I call circular why questioning. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why I did this. How come I do that? Why did I do it? And so having an answer for that now, okay, now let's shift our gears to what am I going to do about it? So then uh, it's possibly having things to tell yourself. Well, being resentful like this is just hurting myself and it's damaging my resentful, my relationship and having a whole bunch of things like that. Uh, If you have an irrational belief uh, system, addressing that. I have a lot of should must rules about the way things should be or the way they have to be. And that's not true. Uh, Life is a series of choices. I choose to do things because I get some good things or I avoid some bad things. I don't have to do this. I can Mm -hmm. choose other alternatives. So some things like that maybe. And then some things to practice. Okay. So when I get resentful, I need to stop and identify what the problem was. What was that triggered me? And I need to decide if it's something that's real, then I need to address it. If it is something that's because of my my, uh, belief systems or my should must rules, then I need to challenge those. Uh, and then you practice doing that. And then again, also, what's the opposite of being resentful? It would be being uh, being um, uh, forgiving, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times a resentful person has a hard time forgiving, right? So I need to start practicing forgiveness, the opposite behavior from the negative one that I'm doing and finding ways that I can think about uh, putting myself in other people's shoes and maybe being more forgiving towards them and uh, maybe even reading some books about that or you know doing some practices in, in that area so coming up with some, some specific behaviors i need to practice as well as things i need to tell myself yeah that's that cognitive behavioral side right <laughs> yes it is and i guess a, a counselor yeah. or coach or therapist um, someone who's trained in this kind of work is someone who can also help keep us accountable as well as we practice those things and we can reflect on on when we did it well and reflect on when the wheels fell off as well so they're always a good person but i liked how you also said just someone who you trust or someone who might be a family friend or a friend who has a good head on their shoulders as well you don't have to pay for for counseling and therapy and all that if you've got someone who's safe that can feel comfortable talking to and can provide some you know reasonable advice as well because a lot of this stuff is not common sense, but a lot of this stuff isn't like, it's not Einstein. It's just right. having a different perspective, you know, helping us through and, and identify that as well. So. In fact, when, when uh, I suggest for people that are using the book for their own anger, that if, you know, if they're in a relationship, have their, have their, 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 their primary partner you know, read it as well mm. and talk about stuff. Because again, as that partner reads about it, understands this person and the struggle they're having with anger and as, if they can dialogue about that, they'll get a lot of insights and it really will help to change them. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, having the, the partner read that aim and, and, and learning it at the same time. And, and also reflecting on them and, and kind of sharing those insights between each other as well. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you've spent a bit of time in America and also overseas as well. Has anger looked different or feel different in different cultures from your experience or is it very much the same? 
Well, very different in Japan. It's very, very polite culture, right? Yeah. So you, you, you stuff stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, and yet you can get, you can get, do that passive aggressive thing very well. <laughs> Compared yeah, to the US, it's... maybe what would it look like in the US? Like oh, you, you, we're, we're more in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Very similar down here, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's Western culture, Eastern culture, right? Western culture, you know, is more legalistic, you know. Uh, Eastern culture tends to be more shame uh, mm -hmm. and your uh, honor based. So, so you, how you handle problems is different. Yeah. Now... I've really enjoyed this conversation. I could talk all day, as I said before. Um, so two more questions and I'll let you go for your, for your evening. Um, thinking about your career and, and your books and, and, mm -hmm. and life as a dad and, and a man as well, and someone who might be sitting listening to this today and, and they're, they know mm -hmm. they're struggling with anger. Um, they want to get help, but they're just not sure where to turn. Like what's some advice that you can give them to to maybe make a phone call or check out a website or, or something just to, to start that wheel in motion and get some help. Well, the internet is probably the best place to do. I mean, if, if you're for, to use anger management, if I'm looking for anger management, I would type in anger management in quotation marks, and then I would put my city uh, mm -hmm. or town outside of it. And that's going to pull up all of the resources in your particular area. Uh, and then it's a matter of then checking out the resources. If you're looking for a counselor, mm -hmm. I know in, in, in the book, I have a whole section on things you should, should ask the counselor. Uh, don't just accept that, that they're going to be an expert in what they do. Uh, yep. Counselors have different areas of expertise. Uh, you need somebody who deals with your type of problem, but you also need somebody who fits your personality. Right? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, so it, and most counselors who are worth their salt, they're going to be willing to talk to you for 15, 10, 15 minutes before you actually go in and book a session. So you talk to them, you know, so how, how long have you worked in this area? Uh, what are some of your approaches? You know, and, and first you need to kind of outline why you're calling, right? Yeah. Uh, that's going on in my life that I'd like to get some help with. Mm -hmm. And then you start asking, so how would you deal with that issue? You know, what's your success rate? You know, uh, what are some of the things you do? Those types of things. And then you yeah. have a conversation. And if they feel like a fit, then you go ahead and you start having sessions. And then you do a, an evaluation after maybe four to six sessions. Okay. Is something happening that's helping me here? Am mm -hmm. I not only getting insight, but am I getting some tools? Are I comfortable with this person? Um, and if the answers are all yes, then you continue, right? If not, then you come back and you say, well, look, I'm... I'm feeling like I'm not getting some tools. I'm feeling like there's a problem here and uh, see if, if the person can adjust their style mm -hmm. to fit that. You know, you don't have to keep paying a person forever and ever just because they have a, you know, a license behind their name. I like that. And, and, and a good yeah. thing about the modern day therapy is, or any therapy, even back then, but you know, history as well, is that if you don't have that connection, just change, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you can change therapists or, or resources or businesses or whatever just to find that right fit because the fit's really important if you don't have the fit then you might not get the insight or you might not get the right. connection and then might not soak in as well so um, it's okay to change and and i tended to be a fairly short-term person um you know after sometimes you got to go long term but you know it was like with like a panic disorder 10 to 15 sessions usually the person would be doing fine yeah. Uh, and those last few sessions, we would be spacing out every two, three weeks or so on as, as they get the, as we take the training wheels off and let them go out and actually practice some of the skills that they've learned. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and the other thought that I had is if you're out in the outback or someplace where there's nobody close by, the internet does offer a lot of uh, video counseling. <laughs> and if there's nothing locally available, sometimes that can be very valuable if, if, if you get the right person. So just yeah. like what we're doing here over YouTube. You can talk to the person and uh, it could be just as just as effective as person to person in person uh, yeah work. definitely definitely mm -hmm. so renee like thanks so much for your time today mm -hmm. if someone's interested to check out the books or read up a bit more about you where's the best place that they can find you since i have a difficult to pronounce and spell the easiest place is my website which is ywhyyemotions.com so okay. whyemotions.com that has links to all my youtube stuff uh, links to the books and just everything so wonderful and I'll, I'll put the link in 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 the show notes as well so people can easily find that but um mm -hmm.
thanks for your time. Um, I really do appreciate your time this, this morning and afternoon over there. Um, and I look forward to maybe yeah, following you in the future and maybe touching base in a future episode and we can talk about a different part of your books or, or whatever. And, and, and yeah, it'd be good to connect again. This has been a lot of fun for me. So Wonderful. I, I thank you for inviting me on. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you loved what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.